theyeshiva.net. I want to begin with wishing each and every one of you to you and your families. May it be a year of uh, abundant blessings for all of you, materially and spiritually, with health and happiness and prosperity. And may Hashem fulfill all of your heart's desires for this year. Thank you. Amen. Next week there will be a class on Tuesday morning, regular time, on Sukkot. So, since this is the charged week of Aserah Simei Tshuva between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, I'm going to, Be'ezer Hashem, explore one central theme that is relevant to Yom Kippur. Everybody knows that good everybody knows that the opening of Yom Kippur Yom Kippur commences with the tefillah known as Kol Nidre Kol Nidre literally means all promises Kol Nidre, all vows why is that the opening of the Yom Kippur service, the Yom Kippur tefillah. The literal halachic reason is that uh, we all know in Yiddishkeit, in Torah and Judaism, a person's words contain a lot of power. Words are not just hollow, valueless, and insignificant, but words have tremendous strength. And therefore the Pasuk says in Parshish Matos that when a person makes a vow, when a person makes a neder, when a person says, I'm making a neder, a promise, a vow, to do a particular thing or to abstain from a particular thing, whatever it may be, as the Pasuk says in Matos, lo yachil dvoray, the person should not be mechalal, should not uh, desecrate or violate his or her word what I promised to do, what came out of my mouth, I should do since often people are dismissive of the power of their own words so therefore the rabbis wanted to choose a time that people should take responsibility for the commitments and the vows that they made for the previous year or that they're going to make for the coming year. When did everybody come to Shul? Everybody came to Shul, Yom Kippur. Other days of the year, not everybody came, but Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, and there were no meals to prepare and so forth, people would come out to Shul. So therefore they chose Yom Kippur to open up with this feel it's not really a prayer it's really a legal uh, it's a legal statement and what do we say we say call nidre all of the vows the pledges the oaths the commitments that I'm going to swear or accept upon myself from this Yom Kippur till next Yom Kippur. So the person, the man or the woman saying the Kol Nidre commits himself or herself to absolve them. Shvikin, Shvisin, Ptelin, Mvutalin, La Shririn, La Kayamin, Nidrana La Nidrein, Esarana La Asarish, Vosana La Shmuas. I'm saying that all the vows I'm going to make are ready from now. I'm telling you they should be nullified as vows. That means if for whatever reason I don't commit to them, I don't do them, I don't implement them, I did not violate the prohibition of layachal dvare because already before I made them, I already uh, punctured. <laughs> I punctured a needle into the blue and I already said it shouldn't have the value, the power of a nether, of an oath, of a prohibition. It should rather be more of a voluntary, volitional commitment, like when somebody says, I'll do something, believe that there, which means I'm going to do it, but I'm not 
accepting it with the force of a neder. So in other words, from this it would come out, when you read the halachic literature, that the association of Kol Nidri with Yom Kippur is more or less technical. It happens to be that everybody comes to Shul. So they wanted to do this at a time when everybody is there, so that the most amount of people could be included in it. If you do it on another day, you won't have part of the community. Why does it have to be the opening of Yom Kippur? Here we also come to another technical component. And that is, one is not supposed to do Hataras Nadarim or Afaras Nadarim on Shabbos or Yom Tif. Halachically, it's not the time to nullify vows. Not past ones, and not future ones. So therefore, if you do it later in Yom Kippur, it's already Yom Tif. But the davening of Yom Kippur starts before sunset. So therefore, before Yom Tov begins, it's the time to do Kol Nidri and nullify the future vows. So why do we call, you say, you go, tonight is Kol Nidri. Jews go to Shul for Kol Nidri. It's almost a technical association. It happens to be that the opening of the Yom Kippur service is with Kol Nidri because it's right before sunset and you want to cap around before Yom Tov. If it didn't happen before sunset, like especially in shuls where there are long sermons before Kol Nidre, or appeals before Kol Nidre, often Kol Nidre happens later. So, okay, but the evidence fine. But L'Chadchil, initially you try to do it before Yom Tif. Yet, there's something amiss about this. It happens to be that in the Jewish mind, we say Kol Nidre is like considered the holiest prayer of the year. It's called Kol Nidre really almost by mistake. <laughs> Because as I said, Kol Nidre is not an essential part of the Yom Kippur experience. Just they wanted everybody in Shul, and they needed it to be before Yom Tov, so it has to be the opening of the Yom Kippur service. So it's like, so you can say everything has mazel. So Kol Nidre had mazel. It fell in, right? Aleinu had mazel, that it's at the end of, was put at the end of davening. So people usually say Aleinu, they say that Aleinu complained to God. That people say Aleinu when they're already walking out of Shul, when they're already in the car, they're putting on the motor, they're saying Aleinu. So Hashem said, you know, for Rosh Hashanah, I'm going to put Aleinu right in the middle of Shemin Esra. So Aleinu got its, uh, its, uh, its, its yichis, its chshivas. Okay, there's an anecdote about it. There was a famous rabbi in Chicago who had a very, very difficult time with the community. The community perse- persecuted him. Whew. And especially the president of the shul. The president of the shul at the Michigan lost Lebanon. He did not let the guy breathe until he finally got rid of it. He, he, he succeeded. He got rid of the rabbi. At the Mazaya Ketzap the Blut, as they say in Yiddish, he really made his life miserable. The rabbi had to leave or retired, whatever, what we call early retirement. So uh, this is the anecdote. I don't know if it's true, but the anecdote is he wanted a little bit of his revenge. So the Shabbos before he left, he got up in Shul and he said, Three creatures came to God to complain. Aleinu, Ashayatsar, and Amamzer. Aleinu said, you put me at the end of davening. It's not fair. No one looks at me. Nobody looks in the siddha. My life tarais. So the Rebbeinu Shalalim said, no worries, Rosh Hashanah, you will be the featured highlight. In the Musaf of Rosh Hashanah, we say Aleinu, Vanachnu Kairim, we kneel, we fall down, it's the opening of Malchias, etc. Asher Yatzer complained, you put my bracha when people are coming out of the bathroom. It's a there's no prominence there. So Hashem said, by Sheva Bracha, at the Chuppah, there's going to be Asher Yatzer, don't worry, you're going to get back your yichas. The Mamza said, just because my parents sinned, yeah? So that's why Ich bin Shul, God said, don't worry, I'll make you the president of the Shul. <laughs> this, was his, this was his revenge on the president of the Shul, and it was remembered a generation later. Okay. So uh, everything needs Mazel, Yasha. Yatsa needs Mazel, Elena needs Mazel, people need Mazel, presidents need Mazel also, as we see. Including of shuls and of countries. Everybody needs mazel. Hakol talib mazel. Kol Nidre had good mazel. <laughs> they decided to nullify the vows in the opening of Yom Kippur. And the whole Yom Kippur mighty was called Kol Nidre. But really, as I said, it seems like to be a technical association. What becomes very difficult, however, is when you listen to the melody of Kol Nidre. The melody that is sung among Jewish communities worldwide for Kol Nidre. 
And it's true, there are alterations, there are variations. Every shul has its cantor, its shliach tzibur, its chazan, its baltfila, who has his own unique kol nidre. But there's a common denominator to all the kol nidres throughout the world. And the melody is one that is extremely heart-stirring. It's emotional. It's profound. And it evokes deep spiritual and emotional experience experiences in the heart of the Jewish people. I once read that Yossel Rosenblatt, who was a world-renowned chazan, was offered, and he was a very poor man. He died also a very poor man. He died suddenly in the hotel in the 1930s. He was visiting here. And uh, he suffered a lot, of, he suffered terrible poverty, even though his chazanas was something unique. And they offered him to do an opera of Kol Nidre in Vienna, which was the capital of opera, still is in many ways. And Yosla Rosenblatt refused to do it. Even though he was offered, I read once that he was offered an exuberant amount of money in the 1920s, close to $50,000, which today you have to uh, multiply it by many times. But Yosla Rosenblatt, I once read this, felt that the uh, Kol Nidre melody has been enshrined in Jewish history with too much sensitivity and sacredness. He felt it would be a violation just to do it for a public opera in the Opera House in Vienna, and he refused. Yosel Rosenblatt was a very big Yerei Shemayim. He was a very Ehrlich Yid. I'll call upon him, Kol Nidre has this, and for many, many generations. Now, the mazel is, I say uh, with a little humor, that most people don't know what Kol Nidre means. So the melody and the words fit, because the words are in Aramaic. But if you'll take a machzah this year in English, <laughs> or you'll learn a little Aramaic, and you'll translate for yourself the words of Kol Nidre, which are important to understand, because Kol Nidre is actually not a prayer. It's a legal testimony. It's almost like a legal document. One of these legal documents you'll get in the mail. And then you try to combine, to synchronize the lyrics with the melody, the niggin with the words, and it's somewhat amiss, to put it mildly. The melody touches on deep chords. The melody goes up and it goes down and it goes up. There is an explosion of emotion. There is deep drama, there's tremendous intensity, suspense, mystery, melancholy, exhilaration, vulnerability, triumph, and victory. Those of you who have a chush in the gina, you appreciate what I'm saying about the melody of Kol Nidre. You put it with the words, and you're like, what? Just to illustrate this to you, I'll show to you how, at the surface it seems, so absurd. Okay. We start off, whatever the Nusach is, but again, I'm just, I'm just doing the main primary notes that are well known. It starts off, But if somebody listens to the translation, all the promises, etc. And we continue all the promises and vows and pledges that I'm going to swear and accept upon myself from this Yom Kippur to next Yom Kippur should be nullified. So we go call Nidre. Anybody has a machzer? <laughs> That's fine. Beseder, beseder. It doesn't have to be meticulous verbatim. This is just uh, for practice. It's not for points. You know, in camp, you did it the first time and then for points. So do all the promises and, excuse me, and the vows and the prohibitions and the pledges that I accept upon myself. Everything I accepted upon myself. 
and he goes, Udi Yasar, Nal Nafsho Sano, and whatever I prohibited on myself from this Yem Kippur till next Yem Kippur. And so he continues, Yoin Sharon, Shvikin, Shvisim, Ptail, and it should all be nullified. All these vows should be nullified. La Shirid, in Velakayam, and they should not have endurance power. How does it conclude? Nidirana alone, Nidirea, Vesarana, Lesore, Ahayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayayay
The alternative was death or expulsion. And they felt they had no choice and they converted. But they continued to identify and behave as Jews secretly. The Spanish themselves gave them a different name, called Moranos, which means pigs. The Jewish term was Anusim, because Anusim means forced. Many of them were caught and burnt at the stake. The Jews who did not want to convert were expelled from Spain in the year 1492, the famous Geir Espana, Tisha B'Av 1492. The finance minister of Spain was Don Yitzchak Abarbanel, and Ferdinand and Isabella, the king and the queen, gave him special permission to stay. Because the finance in Spain, he was part of the major success of the economy in Spain. They even offered him to keep a minion, to keep nine Jews with him, so he should be able to have him with a minion. In other words, they were ready to accommodate him. But Don Yitzchak Abarbanel refused. He said, if my people don't stay, I don't stay. And he himself went into exile, and we know this because he transcribes it. He has a commentary on Chumash and Tanakh, the famous commentary of the Abarbanel, that he wrote after he left to exile to Portugal, and then they were exiled from Portugal, and he went to Italy where he passed away. The Yitzchak Abarbanel, even interestingly, had the Jewish musicians play music, Tisha B'av, 1492, to accompany the Jews leaving Spain in order to liven up their spirits. So even though we don't play music on Tisha B'av, he, Abli, he told them to all play music. And they were playing music as the Jews were leaving Spain. Now you have to understand, Jews in Spain lived, they lived there for hundreds and hundreds of years. We call it the Tur Hazav, the golden, uh, huh? the golden age of Jews in Spain. And it all came to a brutal, sadistic, and inhumane end. A lot of these Anusim, Yom Kippur, they davened. And later, when they can get out of Spain, they wanted to join the Jewish communities. And this became a very controversial and difficult and sensitive issue in Jewish history. Because you have Jews in Amsterdam, in Holland. You have Jews in Italy. You have Jews in Greece, who sacrificed themselves, left everything behind in Spain to remain Jewish. And for this, they had to uproot their family and suffer illness and poverty and death, not to convert. And here you had Jews who chose to convert, to live the better life. And now a decade later, two decades later, they want to join, they made it out. And the other Jew looks and he sees. And you know, you can understand the feelings. It was very, very difficult. It wasn't simple. A lot of the literature of the, of the time deals with this problem. The rabbis and the Charles of Truva is very fascinating and very tragic. But generally, you know how Jews are. They were very lenient. They let them. They embraced them. So Yom Kippur, we say, So Jews who went to the church, who, who worshipped the cross, they felt they had to. On a in Yom Kippur, we let everybody be mispalled together. And Avaryonim means transgressors of all kinds. So some say that the Kol Nidre became associated with this particular area. Meaning, the Jews were saying... All the vows that we're going to make to the church, all the promises that we're going to make to the cross, to the Pope, to Catholicism, that we're good Christians, today we're nullifying it. We're telling you that it's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. This would then explain that there's another component to Kol Nidre, which is indeed very emotional and very painful. Yet, this explanation certainly has merit to it and value to it, but it certainly does not capture the full story because the fact is that that's not what Kol Nidre is. Kol Nidre is all the vows that a person makes and he or she does not specify that it's a Bli Nedr or Shavuos on any issue. I'm not talking about promises they're making to the church and they don't even believe in it. They're just doing it to save their life. They never even thought that it's serious themselves. Here we're talking about every nether. You see it from the text. Is that in any way associated with the melody? Is that in any way associated with this special sense of holiness? Which brings us to another question. The fact that this happens to be the opening of Yom Kippur can't be by mistake. If everything in the world is Bahashgach, if everything in the world is orchestrated by divine providence, certainly Yom Kippur and certainly the Tfilis of Yom Kippur, the fact that Kol Nidre had this mazel, this luck, to fall in in the right place, 
and therefore become the opening of Yom Kippur? Is it really a random, almost error? It's like just good mazel? Or there has to be some connection between Kol Nidri and Yom Kippur? And it's one, t one theme of this issue that I would like to address here today, albeit somewhat briefly and concisely. That the truth is that Kol Nidre has a deeper dimension to it. Like every tefillah, like every piyut, like every poem, every prayer, even every statement could be understood on different layers. Generally in Torah there's pshat and remez and rush and soid. There's literal interpretation, homiletical interpretation, metaphysical interpretation, emotional interpretation, spiritual and so on and so forth. And different books, different works explore different layers of Judaism. The same is true when it comes to the prayers. So when you look at Kol Nidre, you could understand it on a concrete, legal level, which is completely valid and authentic. But one must also cleanse his or her doors of perception and see the deeper layer in the text and the message of Kol Nidre. And when one sees that, one can then appreciate why it not only happens on Yom Kippur, but it's the opening of Yom Kippur. We usher in Yom Kippur with Kol Nidre, and then you'll see how the melody and the lyrics don't only get along with each other, but they actually tell each other's story. The melody reflects the words, and the words reflect the melody as a tremendous uh, couple, coexisting in, in absolute unity and oneness. In order to appreciate this, we have to, for a moment, go back and look at the structure of this time of the Jewish calendar. It's really a little strange that all, so many of the Yom Tovim were packed into one month. It's like, why did Tishrei get so much action? I saw somebody sent out a cartoon, uh, a woman in one of the grocery stores with like 200 grocery bags on the counter. So uh, the man behind the counter looks at her and says, what, another hurricane coming? She says, worse, three days Yom Tov. <laughs> it's like, punct in this month, you have, after Elul, you have Rosh Hashanah, you have Yom Kippur, you have Machir, uh, Erev Yom Kippur, Machis Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, and Shemini Yatzeres, and Samchas Torah, and Yitzchak Chag. Then you go into a month of Cheshvan. The month of Cheshvan is an interesting month. It's the only month in the Jewish holiday that absolutely has no, what you would call, special day, where there's no Tachnon. Every other month, there are unique holidays. Kislev has Hanukkah. Tevis is the end of Hanukkah. Shvat Chamesh Asab Shvat Adir, of course, is Purim. Nisan has Pesach, Ir has Pesach Sheni, Lag Boim, Sfir Asoim, Sivin is Shvuas. Even Tamos. Shiva Asab Tamos in the three weeks, including Tisha B'av, as the Rambam says in Ilchis Tainis, will all be transformed into the greatest Yom Tovim when Mashiach comes. El Avos has Chamesh Asab B'av, El the whole month is Chaydash Sharachem, and Tishrei is, of course, Merube B'mayadus. The month full of Yom Tov. Comes Cheshvan. The boys in yeshiva always dread it. It's a full month, no breaks, no off, Shabbos off. It's like the one month they have to learn Kislev. You're already getting ready for Chanukah. You get ready for Pesach, for camp. It's all over. But Cheshvan. <laughs> Cheshvan is Nebuch. That one month where basically it's the boring month of the year. So it's like going from a hot mikvin to a freezing cold shower. Tishrei is charged with this extraordinary holiness. Then comes Cheshvan, garnish. Like dry. What, what is the structure of all of these Yom Tovim? How do they work exactly? So, according to Chazal, much has to do with the first year of Jewish history, when Moshe went up on the mountain, came down, broke the luchas, went back up to pray, came down again on Yom Kippur. It has to do with that. On another level, which is also connected to the first explanation, it really represents a relationship. A very profound relationship. And every year this relationship is invigorated. You see, we could start earlier, but we'll start for the sake of covering ground and for the sake of brevity, we'll start with Chamish Asabav. The Mishnah says on the 15th of Av, there was no great holiday of the 15th of Av. What happened on the 15th of Av? Shabahen b'nois Yisrael yoytzes v'choyles b'kramim. 
The daughters of Israel would go dance in the vineyards of Yerushalayim. And many shidduchim were created that day. Why Hamisha Sabav? Why was Hamisha Sabav chosen? One of the explanations is, the Bnei Saskar, I think, says this. The world was created Chafei Elul. The world was created on the 25th day of Elul. Chafei was Sunday. Chavav was Monday. Chavzayin was Tuesday. The first Tuesday of creation. Chavches was Wednesday. Chavtes was Thursday. And Aleph Tishrei was Friday when Adam and Chava were created, the first Rosh Hashanah. The first Rosh Hashanah, when the first human beings, Homo sapiens, were created, that's the first Rosh Hashanah on the sixth day of creation. But creation happened six days earlier, the first Sunday. Metzai Shabbos was the first night of creation. That's why Metzai Shabbos, I think people feel they have to go out. Why do they have to go out? Why can't you just stay home Metzai Shabbos? What's the problem? Yeah. I like staying home at Tzai Shabbos. I like staying home every night. But at Tzai Shabbos, people feel they have to go out. They don't even know why. But if you want a spiritual reason for it, it's because on at Tzai Shabbos, God also felt he had to go out and create a world. So we also go out. Okay. That's the first Sunday of creation, Chaf El. The Gemara says in Saitar, Bayim Yayim Kaidim Yitzir Savlat, 40 days before the fetus is formed, they announce in heaven, Bas Ploini Leploini. This young woman is for this young man. These are soulmates. Hopefully one day they'll meet and they'll get married. This is about an individual person. So 40 days before the world was formed, when is that? Tubav, Chamisha Sabav. It's 40 days before. So 40 days before is the cosmic announcement, Bas Ploini Leploini. It's the energy of relationships that come into the world. 40 years before the Reformation, Chamesh HaSabav, and that's where it's reflected in Jewish tradition, Shabahan Bnois Yisrael, Yoytzes V'choylos Bakramim, that's when all these Shaduchim were created, as the Mishnah says at the end of Tainus at length. And it's compared to Chamesh HaSabav and Yom Kippur. The Mishnah says no holidays were as great as Chamesh HaSabav and Yom Kippur. Those two days, Bnois Yisrael would go dancing in the vineyards. Now Chamesh HaSabav, Mele, Mele, Yom Kippur? We don't associate Yom Kippur with this component in our imagination. Because often in our imagination, we divorce heaven from earth. We divorce physical relationships from spiritual relationships. We divorce the body from the soul. But that duality is not a Jewish concept. In Judaism, heaven and earth are one. Soul and body are one. Physical relationships and spiritual relationships mirror each other, reflect each other. The relationship of the chassan and the kala below reflect the relationship of God and humanity above. So therefore, Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, Chamesh above, have this connection. But essentially, it gives us a hint as to the entire structure of the Yom Tovim. So what happens 40 days before the vlad, before the fetus is created? They announce, Bas Ploini Ploini. But the Shidduch didn't happen yet. Nobody was even born yet. The heaven knows that this boy and this girl could work it out if they work on it. It'll work. There's something that connects them. There's, a, there's an inner glue there. Their souls are interconnected, are intertwined. But it still has to ferment. It still has to develop. First of all, it helps to be born. She has to be born. He has to be born. It also helps, by the way, to grow up. I mean, I know not everybody can afford that. But it helps to grow up in order to get married. Maybe sometimes not. Maybe babies get along a little better. They grow up together. As long as they both grow up together. Problem is when one grows up and one decides to remain in the diapers. Psychologically speaking, I mean. But if they both grow up together, it's very helpful. Right? So, but it takes time. But here we're talking with the cosmic process, not as individuals. So we come to Chaydash Elul. The month of El is a very interesting month. On one hand, it's considered a very heavy, a charged month. Revelation of Yud Gimel Midas HaRachman. It's called Chaydash HaRachman. Chaydash HaSlich is Chaydash HaKherzben. It's a regular month in the sense that it doesn't have special Yom Tovim. We say Tachnum, we go to work. It's not like Shabbos or Yom Tif, But there's a certain uniqueness in the month. To explain the uniqueness of this month, the Balatanya Lukudatari gives the famous metaphor of the king in the field. Melech Basadi. He says, all year the king is in the palace. In order to get into the palace, first of all, you need to go through red tape. There's a whole bureaucracy. You need to make an appointment. And who could make an appointment? 
Not everybody could make an appointment. If you have some connections, or you have some relationship, or you have some prominence, you call up to make an appointment, and even then you may have to wait a month, a year, two years, three years. And to get in, you have to know the rules, and when to come, and how to come. That's the king in the palace. But the king in the field, it's like during the president during campaigning season. Joe the plumber and Yankel Finkelstein both have equal access. And during campaigning, you'll see the president never will wear a tie. Never will dress up with a suit, because that will demonstrate distance. You ever see them during campaigning? The president hangs out in gas stations, and in ice cream stores, and in supermarkets, and by definition talks with laymen and laywomen to say, I'm your president. So that's sometimes part of the show, it's part of the political, part of the political game. But the concept that gives us an understanding of what he means when he speaks about the king in the field. The king in the field is open access. And he says, There is a smile, there's a happiness, there's an extraordinary display of, of simcha, of savor upon him, of closeness, of intimacy with everybody. What does this mean in the area, in the realm of a relationship? Tubov, they announced in potential bas pliny le pliny. The month of Elul is the month that we would call, in our language, the month of courtship. The month of courtship between Hashem and the Jew. During courtship, as we know, everybody is in a very different mode of behavior. <laughs> you want to get to know a person. You want to find out who this person is. It's not... It's not a time of commitment yet. It's really a time of exploration. What some people today call dating, they used to call it courtship. <laughs> Somewhat more eloquent. Today they already call it going out, not even dating anymore. Or spending time, or whatever it is. But what is the concept of courtship? The concept of courtship is people are open to explore the other person. To find out about who you are, like in any friendship. It's time to learn, to discover, to explore. Now I know different communities have many, many different customs when it comes to this, and many different traditions. But that's not our topic today, of how these traditions come down in practical day-to-day -day relationships and shaduchim. But the concept of the month of Elul is, Hashem is in the field, and He says, come, let's, so to speak, hang out with each other. I want to get to know you, I want you to get to know me as you are. There's no palace, you don't have to get dressed, don't come dressed in a certain way, because if people during dating are dressed up, I mean emotionally dressed up, they don't talk about who they really are, you all know the disasters that come from that. If I display to you an image of somebody that I'm not, and you display to me an image of somebody you're not, how can we get to know each other? I have to get to know you, and you have to get to know me. So even though you can't compare the level of openness at this stage to a level of openness at a later stage, but if healthy relationships require transparency where you get to know who the other person is, personality, character, disposition, values, what makes you happy, what makes you ha sad, what are you ready to sacrifice for, what does life look like to you, what does child rearing look like to you, what are your values in life, what are your priorities in life, I have to know you. And you have to know me, and I have to know you without garments, and without clothes, and without protocol, and without bureaucracy. The king is in the field. That's the month of Elul. Comes the night of Rosh Hashanah. After four weeks of courtship, the night of Rosh Hashanah, Hashem proposes to the Jew. God proposes. What does a proposal mean? Proposal means, I know enough. I would like to join with you forever. I want to create a life together with you. Or as we say in English, the groom or the potential groom, the young man tells the young woman, I want to marry you. The night of Rosh Hashanah, Hashem makes his proposal. And by the way, the Arizal writes that the night of Rosh Hashanah, the world is very, very frail, very weak. I don't know if you would know, there were great mystics, great tzaddikim, 
who would fall asleep Erev Rosh Hashanah in the afternoon, late afternoon, they fell asleep and at night of Rosh Hashanah they wouldn't speak. Why not? Why? It wasn't a Pesach shtick. There's people who do it with shtick. It's talking about real people. It's a reflection of a certain cosmic energy in the world. You see? God proposes, but the Jews didn't say yes. So the chassan is waiting. Well, not the chassan. He's not a chassan yet. The young man is waiting for her to answer. But on this answer hangs the balance of the entire world. The world was created for this relationship. Not only this world, all the worlds. The entire planet, the entire universe, and all of the universes. So as he's waiting for her answer, the whole cosmos is suspended in suspense. It's in suspense, waiting for the answer. So there's a certain weakness. It's like the whole, the whole all the energy has now a question mark on it. It's withdrawn. It's almost like when you have to reevaluate your whole life. You know, if you're running a company, a very successful company, but it's a headache. And once a year, you sit back and you reevaluate everything. And at that moment, you're ready to close it if you have to. You may be doing everything as you are, but there's a certain weakness in the company because your full vigor is not infused. It's a moment of reevaluating everything. And sometimes in life, you have to be able to step back and start over, all, start over again. Nothing is taken for granted. What happens in life is we get into a rut and then things just happen because they're happening. Maybe you should do it a different way. Who has patience and serenity to reevaluate? But once in a while you have to step back and say, you know what? Let's start from scratch. Maybe everything has to change. That takes a lot of courage because the answers may be different than what we're used to. But that's the night of Rosh Hashanah. So therefore there's a certain, those who are sensitive to energy know that the night of Rosh Hashanah is a very, very uh, intense, intense evening because of this. In, in, in the works of, of, of Teres Anistra, of Kabbalah, and of Musa and of Chassidus, this concept is very well known about the night of Rosh Hashanah. In the morning, now, when somebody proposes after four weeks, again, I know there's different, uh, <laughs> in some communities that's like, whoa, so fast? And in some communities, so long? What are you doing for a month? It should take two hours. And somebody like, only a month? What do you get to know in a month, right? <laughs> what are you going to know in a month? Yeah, give me six months, give me three months, give me six years. In the West Side, give me 20 years. But, but uh, you don't uh, say one month. So the Jew tells Hashem, whoa, 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 whoa. We just got to know each other. It's been four weeks. So God, so to speak, tells the Jew, he says, listen. You know, we could date our whole lives. <laughs> we could do that. People do that. Especially in New York. There's people who just, they do courtship their whole lives. And it's wonderful. No commitment. It's wonderful. It's all based on your moods, when you want, when you don't want. But Hashem tells the Jew, let's face it. I belong to you. And you belong to me. The Gemara usually puts these concepts very succinctly and very powerful and charged words. The Gemara says in Masech the Rosh Hashanah, Daf Tezayin and Daf Lamed Dalet, the track they dedicated to the Rosh Hashanah, that God, Hashem tells the Jewish people, listen to the words. Amr Lam HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yisrael, Hashem tells the Jews, Imru Lefanai Malchiz B'Rosh Hashanah Kadesh Tamlichuni Aleichem. I ask of you, please make me your king over you. Really? He's asking the Jewish people to make him our king. And what if we don't? What's going to happen? We say, God, I'm not interested. He won't be the king? It's a different type of relationship. What God is asking is a conscious, volitional relationship in which your identity is present. You're fully conscious of the relationship. Let's say a Jew on Rosh Hashanah says, you're not my king. Besides me. You could reign over the whole world, but not over me. <laughs> what happens? This person doesn't have to breathe. This person doesn't have to live. This stuff person doesn't have to exist. You're not part of the planet. You're not getting nutrients from sun. You're not getting nutrients from the earth. You're not drinking the water. You're not inhaling the oxygen, really. 
God could say, you have to make me my king, your king. You don't like it? Go to another planet. But that planet is also mine. The Jew says, no problem, I'll live on Mars. He says, no, 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 make your own planet. He says, where am I going to make my own planet? He says, figure it out. It's not my problem. But that's not what the Gemara says. Hashem says, Tamlichuni Aleichem. I need you to make me king. Why? Because that's the definition of a relationship. The definition of a relationship is you can't force somebody into a marriage. I can't tell you, I'm telling you, propose. I'm telling you, say yes. I'm commanding you. And when you do that, oiva avoid to such a relationship. You may sometimes have to transcend fears, transcend insecurities, challenge yourself, but that's not called coercion. That's called growth. There's a difference between stretching, flexing muscles, building tissue, and forcing, abusing. It's a very different, different creature. So, so Hashem says, listen, we can date forever, but I belong to you, you belong to me. So the Jews tell God, give me a night. You ever did that? Any of you did that? I have to think it over. My wife did that to me. <laughs> I propose, she says, it's not so simple. I got to think it over. So that's what we did. I guess she learned it from the Jewish people. Maybe from other people, I don't know. So Hashem answers, what do you need? The Jew says, give me the night. The night of Rosh Hashanah. That's the intensity of the night of Rosh Hashanah. In the morning, the Jews have an answer. But we don't just say yes. We say yes with class. How do we say yes? You take out a ram's horn. This is, this is, this is called a class. You don't just stop yes, yes, okay. We take out a ram's horn of a blast. And the type of blowing captures the nature of the relationship. In a relationship, there's tkia, there's shvarim, there's trua, there's tkia. Right? There's the moments of the relationship that are just like straight, clear, pure, easy, smooth. Do, And then the moments of the relationship that are like, you want to raise your hands if you experience number two? <laughs> Shvarim. <laughs> Shvarim, the Gemara says in Rosh Hashanah, Lamad Gimel is Gnuche Gonich. It's like a moan, a groan. Uh, uh, uh. I don't know what type of Baltikeya you had. But if he knew what he was doing, he didn't capture this. You need somebody who knows how to make a broken sound. And then you have a truer. Times when you sob. <laughs> but the key of a relationship is the shvarim and the truer are sandwiched between a tkiya and a tkiya. Always. In other words, my pain, my brokenness, I could share with you. So therefore... There is a relationship, there is a hope, there is a love, there is a camaraderie. Levi Yitzhak Badichev writes in Kedusha Slevi that the Gemara says in Yevamist, Tkiya means love. Tkiya means etched. It means blow. It also means etched. When somebody's soul is etched in another person's soul, it's called Tkiya love. So he says in life, people have shvar and people have trua, but you always have to remember the love before and the love after. It has to be sandwiched in love. Love of yourself and love of the other. So that you can accept the shvarim and trua in the context of profound self, self affirmation. And the last key is tkiya gdoila. Because often we ask ourselves, why do we have to go through shvarim and trua? But the truth is, the tkiya that you reach after shvarim and trua is a far deeper, longer, and more powerful tkiya than the tkiya before the shvarim and trua. When we're born, we also make sounds, but when we're born, life is pristine, it's straight, it's simple. As we grow up, we go through disappointments. We endure failure. Some of us endure profound pain, sometimes even trauma, sometimes abuse. Each one with their peckle in life, but people experience moaning, groaning, and sobbing, and sometimes together, shmarim man trua. But the message of Tkiya Shoifer is that there is always a relationship. You're always in a relationship. You're always in a relationship with God. You're always in a relationship with the deepest part of your soul that remains wholesome. And therefore, through your pain, you can reach to a deeper tkiya, to the core of your to the core of your value, to the core of your soul. And that's a tkiya gdoila. Vahoya bayoyma yitoka 
There are those who are lost in the land of Ashur, and those who are cast away in the land of Mitzrayim, and they're different. Ashur means what? Ashur comes from the word Oisher. What does Oisher mean? Prosperity. Mitzrayim comes from the word Mitzrayim, restrictions. There are people who are lost in the land of prosperity. And there are those who are nidach, are forlorn, in the land of confinements. There are those who are lost because of prosperity. They have no boundaries. And there are those who are lost because they have too many boundaries. There are those who are lost because they have everything and they take life for granted. They become narcissistic, pompous, arrogant, spoiled, rotten. And there are those Be'eretz Mitzrayim. They have so much pain and distress and they're also lost because of it. And both have to discover that the shoifer gadol v'ishtachavu l'Hashem ba'ara kodesh b'Yerushalayim. So this is the way the Jews say yes. I told you it's a classy yes. It's not time we take a shoifer and, and, and blow. God shows a good kala, a sophisticated kala he chose for himself. So we said yes. Okay. No. Usually between proposal and engagement, and the wedding, could take a long time. You need a caterer, and you need a hall, and you need a book, and you need a musician, and you need flowers, and then comes the gown. We're not going to talk about the gown. And the shtraimel, and the spadak, or whatever it is, and then there's dealing with the mechutten, and then there's dealing with who gets a bracha under the chuppah, and it could take a few months. But since God has access to the caterer, and to the hall, and to the flowers, and even to the bar. So therefore he says, let's prepare for the chasana. The Jew says, when? He says, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur will get married. In between, you have a Sarah Sameh Shuva to get ready. To get ready for the wedding. Yom Kippur is the day of the wedding. This is the Mishnah clearly says, This is Yom Kippur, the day that the second luchas were given. This was the second marriage, so to speak, after the first one was broken. This was the second marriage, which came after rehabilitation. This is the chasana of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is really a day of wedding. That's why the chasana and the kala have a minute to fast on the day of their wedding. What do we do on Yom Kippur? We fast. The kala on the day of her wedding is dressed in white. How do we dress on Yom Kippur? Everybody dresses in white. Loiv shem levenem umesat from levenem. Why in white? Because every Jew is a kala hanichneses lechupasa on Yom Kippur. And that's why we fast. Now a wedding has in the different stages. The beginning of a wedding, the first half of the wedding is solemn. There's a certain sense of seriousness, of introspection. It's a very, very powerful moment. Two halves of one soul, not uniting, but reuniting. And here it's not just a wedding of two individuals. It's a wedding literally of heaven and earth, of spirit and matter of energy and containers, of Oyer and Keli, of Neshama and Guv, Shamayim and Eretz, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Knesset Yisrael. It's the integration of all components of reality, the spiritual and the physical, into a cohesive, seamless whole. So Yom Kippur is that day of the Chasana, and it starts off with, with an element of introspection, and generally the whole day of Yom Kippur is a day of a relationship. How do you begin a relationship? How do you begin the chuppah? You begin the chuppah with kol nidre. Why do you begin the chuppah with kol nidre? Now we come to the deeper layer of kol nidre. You see, there are two types of promises we make in life. There are promises that are very technical. I make a promise that I will not eat any more. From this Yom Kippur to next Yom Kippur, no cheesecake. Anybody familiar with those promises? No carbs, no white flour, right? Some Jews are even better, they're not going to eat. Those are the real commitments. I'm not even going to eat, I'm not even going to touch food. Who wants to touch food? Of course, till 10 minutes when you feel stressed. And then the pantry opens up. What usually happens after commitments that are impossible to fulfill is you go to the other extreme. <laughs> Because now you can, you're not only breaking your commitment, you also have to suppress the pain of the fact that you couldn't live up to your commitment. This is where binging comes in. 
Because now you have to also deal with the pain that you couldn't follow through with yourself. In other words, the pain of failure and all your self deprecating thoughts about who you are or who you're not emerge and now the next food is not only breaking the old vow it's dealing with everything as a result of the old vow so the vow is really part of the addiction and this is where life becomes very very interesting I'm making a vow that I'm not gonna do it and really this vow is part of the destructiveness why because it's completely not grounded in my true reality the vow itself is a form of escapism. The vow itself is a form of fear. The vow itself is just a response to guilt. It's not a vow that's coming from a place of deep empowerment or true self-awareness. You with me? Because I was talking to men, I would have to explain this for two and a half hours now to prove that I'm, that I'm not crazy and insane. Okay, but I'm sure some of you get it. Maybe all of you get it. I don't get it, but I know it sounds good. Like it sounds something that uh, sophisticated people would say, no? Okay, so the first thing is called Nidre. So there are the vows, I'm not going to eat cheesecake, I'll do this, I won't do this, I'll visit this person, I, whatever, all these Nidorim that we make. But what does it mean on a deeper level? A vow represents an oath, a vow, a restriction. I make a vow that I'm not going to eat this, I'm not going to eat this. My hands are now tied. Whether it's a vow to do something or not to do something, but my hands are tied. All the expressions of kol nidre, nidre v'charama v'kainama v'kinuse v'chinui, you'll see all these expressions in the machzer. Some people think it's semantics. They're not semantics. They're different forms of attachments that people have to things or people or items, as a result of which the person becomes confined by an internal vow and a promise I make to myself that I am not capable of certain things. Some people, very early on in our lives, have decided that we are destined to loneliness. A person told me yesterday, I was created to be alone forever. Nobody will ever, ever understand me. And as they live life, that feeling is confirmed again and again because people don't understand them. And that story is repeated and it becomes ingrained in the person's soul. They can't really trust. How can I trust somebody who will ultimately backstab me because they simply are clueless? And a person lives life from that place of confinement. Some of us, we have a story that ingrains us with deep fear, deep shame, deep guilt, deep, deep insecurity, deep trauma. Some of us have different stories, different narratives, different concepts of ourselves that we share with ourselves that keep us in shackles, they keep us bound. Those are the oaths, the nadarim, I say, I can't do this. I'm not capable of having a powerful relationship. I'm not capable of being happy. I'm not capable of living a full, invigorated, profound, meaningful, wholesome life. I'm not. I'm crushed. I have been splintered. I have been fragmented. Do you know what I went through? Do you know what happened with me at this point and at this point? You know what's happening right now in my house? I can't be the father I would like to be, the mother I would like to be, the husband I would like to be, the wife, the person I would like to be, the Jew I would like to be. I am damaged goods. Would you not be damaged goods? Let me tell you the story. And trust me, these are stories that people went through. Sometimes by mistake, sometimes in pr on purpose, sometimes people did it maliciously, very often not. But the result is, I live in a particular box, a self concept that's where I operate from. Let's take it one step deeper. If I would ask you, does anybody really know you? You have friends, you have acquaintances, you have neighbors on your block. You have even people you may go out with for coffee after this year with. There's people you may exercise with, there's people you may schmooze with. There's people who are family members, people you meet at bar mitzvahs, people you meet in shul, you meet at meals, you meet at chevrels, you sit around the table. But does anybody really know you? Does anybody know you fully? You don't have to all answer at the same time. Does anybody know you? And many people will say no. <laughs> no. Nobody really, really knows me. They know a certain part of me. 
Do you allow yourself to be known? Maybe not. Do you know you? Not if, but do you know you? And often people will say, yes, I know me. Can you swear that you know yourself? Can you, of course I could swear. Of course I could swear that I know me. And you're right, from your perspective, you're right. Who knows you as well as you? I was once at a recovery Shabbos in Boca, and an addict who's in recovery for 30 years. These are people who have worked through life. To be in recovery for 30 years and not relapse once, you have to fight. And he got up, he got up at the mic, and I remember he said, he called himself, we addicts. He's been sober for 30 years, but he called himself an addict. And he said, we addicts, he said, we know us. This was his quip, his, uh, his, cute ex his, his expression. We know us. Meaning, nobody knows us like we know us. We know all of our sly, shrewd, mischievous, winding pathways to try to hide our addiction and get what we need to get in order to deal, and numb, deal with our pain and numb our trauma. Who knows you like you? Nobody knows you like you. You know yourself like nobody knows you. Because it's you. Does somebody know me like I know me? Does somebody know you like you know me? Like you know you? <laughs> they say chutzpah is somebody who comes to the therapist because he has a split personality and then he wants a group discount. <laughs> but even that nobody knows like you know. You know there's something that you know about yourself that is just different. <laughs> You don't have to talk about it. You don't have to explain. You don't have to, you don't have to machazoy. You don't have to say, you don't get it. You get it. <laughs> it all originates within you. So sometimes we swear to ourselves that we know ourselves. You're with me? We make a shvua conceptually. I swear to me that I know me. And nobody's going to break that. Because you don't know me like I know me. But then comes Yom Kippur night. And Yom Kippur night, there's an energy that comes into the universe. And suddenly, you look at yourself in the mirror, conceptually, and you say, I didn't know me. I don't know me. There's a me that is deeper than I ever imagined. There is a me that is unbound, that is unconfined. There is a me that is wholesome, that is a ray of infinity. There is my soul, which is a chelik alikami a fragment of the divine, which is filled with infinite love, confidence, wholesomeness, purity, vigor, power, courage, fearlessness, possibility, and hope and optimism. And no experience in the world, not even the narrative I tell myself, not even my self-concept of who I am, can ultimately squash it, crush it, or destroy it. Even if I have endured over my life various experiences, painful experiences from people whom I trusted as a child, and some of you sitting in this room know all too well what I'm referring to. People you trust most as a child. The people who were supposed to be your greatest protectors. The people that when you left their womb, they were supposed to give you a vow. That in this world, I will protect you. I will be here for you. You will be safe in my arms. And when a person, a child is betrayed by those people, the betrayal is beyond because I wasn't just betrayed by somebody whom I never really could trust. It's the person I'm ready to surrender my entire psyche to. Can you imagine what the story I tell myself about myself as a result of that? How many people walk around the streets, walk in their own homes, and they're shadows of their true selves because of this self-concept of what they tell themselves as a result of what they experience. And again, the people who perpetrated it didn't even always know what they're doing. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. But sometimes it's almost irrelevant in terms of the impact, the damage. Comes the night of Yom Kippur, and the first thing the Jew says is, now listen to the niggin. Now listen to the niggin and tell me if it matches. Nidra na la nidre 
This is the cry of a soul, the anguish of a soul who had to encounter so many various promises, vows, self-restrictions, self-prohibitions, oaths that I made to myself about myself. I can't. I'm incapable. This will never happen. Not in my lifetime. Not in my marriage. Not in my house. Not in my relationship with my parents, my siblings, my children, myself, my God, other people. This is my confined story. From here I will live and here I will die forever. This is my place. And here Yom Kippur night, the soul's wings are given permission to soar. Imagine the sight of a bird. I was once walking with my father, a young child I was, in Eretz Yisrael. I was as a mamish, a little kid. And I remember we were walking to a Shul Shabbos early morning in Yerushalayim. And we walked by a ditch. And there was a bird there. And the bird's wings were clipped. And the bird was trying to come out of the ditch. And my father looked and said, if it would have had wings, it could just soar. But its wings were clipped. And therefore it remains here for the remainder of its life. That's what he told me. And I felt so bad for the bird. When I grew up, I understood he was really sharing a parable for life. I still feel bad for the bird. Don't get me wrong. But how many birds are there like this? They're in the ditch and they remain in the ditch because, at least in their mind, their wings are clipped. So this is where they have to remain. Comes Yom Kippur and the soul suddenly experiences a rush, a flow, an energy. There's an energy in the cosmos. A new relationship is being formed. The chup is opening up. You're one with the divine. That means you're an ambassador of the divine. That means you have infinity within you. That means you're invincible. It means that your core is indestructible. So all the destructiveness that you may have perceived and experienced, and it was valid, but it couldn't turn you into damaged goods. So the first statement is kol nidre. Now the soul reaches its crescendo. My promises are no promises. I. This is not a legal statement only. This is a profound existential declaration. As tears wash over your body and you set yourself free, you discover the birds that were never, the wings that were never clipped, they were only tied. Sometimes you see that the wings were tied, they were not cut. And if I can get rid of that knot, I can untie it. I could declare, Shvisin, Betelin, Mavatalin, Lashirin, Velakayamin, Nidran Allah, Nidre, Saran Allah, sorry, Shuasan Allah, Shavuas. And we say Kal Nidre three times because there are three different types of vows that people make to themselves in life. But that's not the discussion now because that's a whole other sugya. There are three types of nidarim we make. We repeat it three times. Each time is a deeper realization of this truth. And now I can actually also be in a relationship with somebody else. As long as I am tied up in my own story, I can't even be in a relationship with anybody else. As I can't even be in a relationship with myself. My entire relationship is filtered through a very particular narrow filter and everything the other person tells me is filtered through that filter. I don't even hear what you're saying. I hear what I think you're saying based on what I think about myself, which allows me to experience everything you're saying through that particular narrow experience of the self. Does this just make sense? Okay, good. It worked. But if I could, if I could, if I can absolve myself from that, I can actually enter into the Kiddushan, into the Chuppah. So Yom Kippur is that experience of that night of the wedding, that night of the chuppah. And all of the tefillahs are revolved around that relationship. 
And that's why the Gemara, Gemara explains and the Rambam brings it la it's What creates the atonement of Yom Kippur is the very day itself. Now that's strange. I can understand if you say tshuva, repentance creates atonement. But Yom Kippur is not just tshuva. It's The day forgives. How can a day forgive? October 26 comes, you're forgiven. Why? What? When? The answer is, some days bring forth with them a certain energy. The day of Yom Kippur brings forth into the cosmos a certain energy. When that energy is exposed, you discover that you never left. You were never alienated. You never betrayed anybody. The only one you betrayed was you because you didn't know how good you were, how holy you were, how wholesome you are. In other words, Yom Kippur is the discovery that the true you never sinned. The true you was always one with God. The reason I sin, the reason I make all these mistakes is only because I don't recognize who I am. The moment I'm in touch with who I am and I recognize the true I, that real I is always in a state of intimacy with God. Always pure, always powerful. However, when I become alienated from my very self, that's when I start sinning, which means, understand this, that the greatest sin that we commit is that we believe that we are sinners. The greatest sin we commit in life is that we really believe that we are sinners, that we're bad people. We're driven by guilt. We think that God hates us. And we respond in kind usually, even if we deny it. That's the greatest shuvah. You know what you need shuvah most? You need shuvah on the most on the fact that you think that you really need shuvah. Let me explain what I mean. So nobody takes it out of context. Of course I need to fix my mistakes. Of course I need to ask forgiveness. But what am I asking forgiveness for? I'm asking forgiveness for the fact that I betrayed my true essence. And I betrayed you as a result. In other words, I, the true I, never sinned. The chelik eleikami mal in a person always remains one with Hashem. Nothing can sever that relationship. No mistake can destroy that relationship. It's indestructible in its power, in its purity, in its holiness, in its infinity, in its sacredness. The tshuva is for the fact that I lived a life inconsistent with who I really am, so I want to align my external self with my internal self. And in fact, the more you really know you, the less you sin, because the true I is beyond such mistakes, beyond such sins. So therefore, Yom Kippur is the day of chasana, until you hit Ne'ilah, you reach Ne'ilah. You know... That Ni'ila, what did you learn in school? Why is Ni'ila called Ni'ila? You remember what they tell you? Closing of the gates. Closing of the gates. The gates are about to close, so therefore what do you got to do? Madafarai chaper, throw in the papers fast, because the gates, the garage is closing, you don't want to have your neck. You know when the garage comes down? Ni'ila means sun is setting, the gates are about to close. Chaparai n'tsun over. And that interpretation says that's true. But we want to go to a step, you want to go a step deeper. What happens after the chuppah? What happens after the chuppah? It's really a part of the chuppah, people don't realize. What do the chassan and kala do? They go into the yichud room. In fact, according to many opinions in Allah, that is the chuppah. That is what creates the marriage. Not the first part of the chuppah is the introduction. That's why you'll see that the witnesses who are by the chuppah, the rabbi will always rush, so the witnesses come to the yichud room. They have to be there. The chassan and kala go to the yichud room and they're alone. Nobody could be there, not even the shriger, and a bigger chiddush, not even the photographer. Even the photographer who thinks he owns the wedding and who pushes everybody around because he's the boss. You're paying him, but he's your boss. Even the photographer, thank God, leaves that room. And they usually prepare the yichud room. There's good sushi, there's good orange juice, there's good cake, there's grapes and all types of stuff. And from all the years I went to weddings or officiated weddings, I always saw the same thing. The chassan and kala don't touch the food. Which for the rabbi and the photographer is always great news because we come in afterwards and we take all the spoil and all the booty. All for ourselves. And we have doggy bags for months. Because they prepare chveis. That's where the food is. At the wedding it's hard to find food. But in the yichud room, that's where the food is. And we know later we're not going to have food. So for the photographer and the rabbis have a deal, an old confidential deal that they eat up all the food. But it's funny, the chassan and kala fasted all day, but they don't eat then. Why? The answer is usually that adrenaline is so intense, the excitement is so big, they don't feel their hunger. So now let's go deeper what, what ni'ilah is. Ni'ilah means closing. 
So literally, or I should say on a more superficial level, what's closing? The gates of heaven are closing, and you want to beseech Hashem before they close. But there's a deeper interpretation to Ne'ilah. And the deeper interpretation to Ne'ilah, I once heard from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, he said, what's Ne'ilah? The Ne'ilah is the gates of heaven are closed, but you're inside. That's Ne'ilah. Ne'ilah, the gates of heaven are closed, and every Jew is inside. It's the Yichud room. It's the culmination of the chuppah. And that's why you'll see Jews who complain to Hoyim Kippah how hungry they are. Which is what good Jews do. Just a cup of water. Every Jew, just a cup of water. I'm fine, just a coffee, just a coffee. We heard it last year, two years ago, enough with your coffee. <laughs> Suddenly by Ne'ilah, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Uelekim, Baruch Shem, people don't feel that hunger. On a literal level you say, of course, the food is coming. But there's a much deeper level. It's not just the food is coming. That's a superficial interpretation. Because in the Yichud room, the Chassan and Kala are not hungry. Because there's such a powerful sense of oneness. There's such an intimacy. Yisrael o Malka bil The Jew is alone with his father, with his mother, with her father and mother, with Hashem. The Jew and the king alone. There's no sense of any other need, any other void. So Ne'ilah is the culmination of the Chuppah. It's the Yichud room. That's the sense that the Jew has by Ne'ilah. The sense of Ne'ilah is that experience of Yichud, following Elul, following Chamesh HaSabah, following Asar Simei Tshuva Yim Kippur. What happens when the Chassan and Kala come out of the Yichud room? What happens? Now the wedding shifts gears. From a more solemn, introspective experience, what happens after the Yichud room? The dancing, the festivities begin. What happens after Yim Kippur? We go into Sukkot. Sukkot, people think, is a separate Yom Tov from Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It's not. What happens Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur on one level happens on Sukkot and Simchas Torah on another level. It's like the two halves of the wedding. It's not a different Chassan and Kala. People who separate the two halves of the wedding don't get it. It's all the relationship. So now you'll ask me, what do you do four days between Yom Kippur and Sukkot? That's for pictures. <laughs> you know, between the Yichud room and the, and the, and the wedding. So you have Sukkot. What's Sukkot? Sukkot is seven days of celebration. It's basically the festivity of the Chasana. Simcha's Beis HaShayeva Lo Simcha Miyamav. It's a Simcha, and it's a Simcha for the world. Nature celebrates. The Lulav, the Estrog, the Hadas, the Arava. You're outside. The universe celebrates. Everybody comes to the wedding. It says that Sukkot, they offered 70 bulls corresponding to the 70 nations. Because the whole world comes to the wedding. Everybody is dancing. And it's seven days of festivity, seven days of dancing. This is the celebration of the courtship of Elul, the proposal and engagement of Rosh Hashanah, and the marriage and Yichud of Yom Kippur. What happens after the wedding? After the wedding, so mommy and Tati have to pay the caterer. And that's when it becomes a little challenging. But now the lights go out, and we send the Chassan and Kala home. And now it's time to start, as we say, playing house and building their own lives together. So Shemini Atzeres Sim is a different energy. Shemini Atzeres Sim that Rizal says, that's the time of intimacy. It's when the marriage between Hashem and the Jewish people is consummated. It's not anymore for the whole world. Sukkot, you're outdoors. Sukkot, you shake the Arba Minim. Sukkot, the Simchas Beis outside. Shmini Atzer Simchas Torah is the Chassan and the Kala alone. Yiyu lechol avadcha ve'ein lezore mitach. It says Shmini Atzer is no 70 bulls anymore. Par echad, ayil echad. So the Zoyar says, Yiyu lechol avadcha ve'ein lezore mitach. It's intimacy. Intimacy, there's nobody in the room. Nobody belongs there. It's a moment of secrecy. It's a moment of privacy. It's oneness. That's when Hashem and the Jew consummate their relationship, become one flesh. That's why, what do we do on Shemini Yatzeres? What do we start davening for? We start davening for Geshem, for rain. Zagdar Rizal. What is rain? Rain essentially is the procreative seed of life that comes from heaven. It's absorbed by Mother Earth. It's nurtured by Mother Earth, and it produces the world of botany. That's the energy of Shemini Atzeres because there's the cosmic intimacy between heaven and earth. 
So heaven produces the procreative fluids, which we call rain, which is essentially the seed of life, absorbed by the femininity of earth, Eretz. Hakal hoyim and offer everything comes from the earth. Chavas, Aim Kol Chai, the mother of living spirits, who comes together with Adam from Afra bin Adama, and then the botany, the world of Tzimeach is produced. Yes, there's pregnancy during the winter months, and then spring emerges, and everything emerges. The child, the children emerge. In fact, Arizal says, Shvi Shal Pesach, Kriyas Yams of the sea splits, is essentially the splitting of the cosmic womb, which produces the first souls. All Neshamas Yisrael are conceived on Shmini Yatzeres and Simchas All souls of every Jew, the conception spiritually I'm talking about, is Shmini, I'm, not, I'm talking about spiritually, I'm not talking physically. Spiritually all souls are conceived Shmini Yatzeres and Simchas The birth is Kriyas Yamsuf, which is a unique moment, that's Pesach. And then throughout the spring and the summer months. So therefore, Shmini Yatzeres and Simchas has a Simcha in it that even Sukkot doesn't have. The joy of Hakafas has something in it that is even more profound than Sukkot. Because Sukkot is, so to speak, the wedding. <laughs> that's the pictures, that's for the albums. It's great, it's beautiful, it's awesome. The ganze Welt tanzt. But Shmini Atzeres Simchas is the intimacy of the relationship. What happens after Shmini Atzeres Simchas So you have Isra Chag, you have the end of Tishrei. You have the Sheva Brachas, you have the honeymoon. And now you'll see, you come to the next month, what's Cheshven? Cheshven is real marriage. <laughs> the honeymoon is over. The, wo- the money for the wedding. Uh, huh? Sometimes it's called Mar Cheshven, right? So you'll, I asked before, why do we go from a hot, hot sauna to a cold, cold pool? From a month charged with so much holiness to a month, the only month in the year that's devoid of any semblance of a holiday? Because actually that's where the real relationship emerges. It's easier to have a fun, excited marriage when my fart, my gate, my life, my vacations here, honeymoons here, sheva brachas in there, because you're not dealing with yourself. (laughs) You're dealing with everybody else. The moment you have to start dealing with yourself, there's no external circumstances to massage the situation. This is where some marriages blossom, and some marriages endure a tremendous challenge because the lights are gone, the lights are, are dimmed or off. So from Tishrei, which is the month when the relationship is formed and developed, we enter into the month of Cheshven, which actually has no external fanfare and drama to support the couple externally because now one has to go into their own resources and find their relationship with themselves and with Hashem in the daily grind of life, in the boring, monotonous days, the days filled with schedules and patterns and routines, to be able to create the stuff that's called life, to be able to see the extraordinary within the ordinary, and the miraculous within the natural, and the symphony within the day-to-day existence. So therefore, the entire cycle of Elul and Tishrei are not just holidays, you know, God says, let's just hakarain another holiday. Okay, let's put it, let's just get it over with. Let's put in all the holidays and we can get to winter. And then to do us a favor, you put in a Hanukkah, and a Purim, and then Pesach just to give you a break and to have people cleaning for a few months. But rather there is a clearly uh, orchestrated design in terms of a relationship. So therefore we finally come back. When it comes to Yom Kippur, and we begin Yom Kippur with Kol Nidre. It's not Kol Nidre just had Mazel. Kol Nidre is associated with the essence of Yom Kippur. Kol Nidre is associated with the essential energy and message of Yom Kippur. And the melody of Kol Nidre captures Yom Kippur. And that's why we open up Yom Kippur with Kol Nidre. So the Balatanya says, why do we open up Yom Kippur with Kol Nidre? Because Kol Nidre captures the very power of every single soul on Yom Kippur to allow its true freedom to express itself, to express itself without inhibition, without restriction, without confinement, and let its true, true sacred power and deep purity and holiness emerge in its full, infinite splendor. 
Have a wonderful week and a gmar chsimah toiva, a good geben shtar to you and your families. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.